dentro de unos años tendremos varias docenas, así que espero que sea muy efectiva la plática del doctor Berti. Eh, me dijo que les dijera que él es un ranchero sueco. Ahí dice hasta ahora. Eh, en realidad es un bioquímico sueco que ha trabajado en muchos lugares. Eh, no solamente sigue trabajando en problemas de punta de bioquímica, sino que además ha sido presidente de universidades muy, muy importantes, en particular la última es esta Universidad Tecnológica en Singapur. Y ahora, como pueden ver, sigue siendo profesor emérito ahí, aunque formalmente ya no es el, el, el director, el rector, digamos. Pero sigue eh, yendo cada X tiempo para allá. Eh, él ha trabajado en los grupos que eligen a los premios Nobel y además tiene muchas ideas de cómo innovar y de cómo cambiar la educación. El día de hoy básicamente nos va a hablar de premios Nobel, pero ya le pedí que venga en unos meses de regreso para hablarnos sobre educación del futuro, que creo que es un tema en el que todos los aquí presentes tenemos que, que pensar y discutir. Eh, su currículum es muy largo, seguramente lo vieron en las presentaciones en la red, además seguramente vieron que sabe hacer muchas otras cosas, pero no le quito más tiempo y es un honor para mí y un gusto presentar al doctor Bertil Anderson. said before. Right? So uh, uh, um, I, I come from uh, uh, Sweden, as you heard. I understand that uh, the dean here said I come from a farm, and that's correct. So in my life travel, I, I came from a, a Swedish farm to be president of a Singapore university. But you see, Sweden and Singapore both starts with an S, so it's about the same, you know. But it's cold or, or, or warm, of course. And uh, Now, since I retired some months ago, I was offered to come and work at another university. I don't know if you heard about it. It's called Tech de Monterrey. So, so I'm uh, going to work there. But I'm really happy to be here at the UNAM uh, as well. And they asked me, what do you want to talk about, Professor Anderson? I said, do you want to talk about university administration? They didn't seem very enthusiastic about that. And so then I said, maybe you can talk about your research, of course, I said, you know. But then we yeah, come up with the idea, how to win a Nobel Prize. I'm sure all UNAM students want to win a Nobel Prize. I said, if I give a talk like that, everyone will come. And, I, you know, it's almost full here. So that was the right tactics, right? So, uh, so I spent uh, 12 years in Singapore as president of, and provost of the university. It was not in my life plan, but I think what is interesting when you do, when you're in academia, of course you think, what should I do when I graduated and so on, and you could always have your plans, but you see, life is full of surprises, and I followed the, the surprises and ended up in Singapore. It was not in my life plan, but it was a very rewarding time to work with academia in Asia, because we should all realize if we are European or working, uh, living in the Americas, how much things are changing in Asia, how Ch Asia is building education, how Asia is building research, how Asia is building universities. They're very important, and I would encourage you all to go to Singapore, Asia, to see and do, do exchange with, with, with Singapore. And that's why, partly why I'm here to, to d d discuss. Uh, I did a lot of things before that, so I was leading European research. I was also a president of a Swedish university and a dean and so on. And uh, of course, I was head of the Nobel Committee in Stockholm, particularly in, in chemistry. And a little bit uh, 
why I'm going to give this talk, because I've been involved in giving Nobel Prizes. But you see, what I'm most happy about is the picture there to the left when I was an active biochemistry researcher being in the lab doing experiments. And you'd notice the difference. As long as I was a happy researcher, I had all my hair on there. <laughs> After I started to be in management and quarreling with professors and so on, you know, the hair was gone. But that's okay. And now I'm here in Mont Mont Monterrey to be an advisor to Monterey uh, and uh, uh, to, to maybe share a little experience how we built research in Sweden, in Europe, and also have built research in, in, in Monterey. So I like to be here in Mexico, and of course my big secret, I don't know if the dean said something, is this, is my wife who is Mexican, isn't that fantastic? And I just learned, I just learned, that my wife was a schoolmate for Eudine here, right? So it's a small world. Uh, and my wife is also a professor in biochemistry. Uh, and uh, so I, I feel at home here, you know. And, and, and people said, you know, have you ever ate molly before or guacamole? And I said, I eat it every day. I have a Mexican wife, right? <laughs> so I'm quite well acquainted here. But now I come to my real talk. And that is how... No, I'm something. Um, Nobel Prizes. So, you all have heard about the Nobel Prize. It's given out in Stockholm and Oslo every year. And the Nobel Prize is quite iconic. It is the prize of the prizes. There are many other prizes for culture, for literature, and for science. But the Nobel Prize is still the number one. Uh, and um, I think it's a lot to, to talk about with the Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize um, is given in several subjects. It's given and since 1901, so it's a well over 100 years there have been Nobel Prizes. And they're given in physics, in chemistry, medicine and physiology. Um, and this you could say, people talk about are the science prizes. Then of course you have a Nobel Prize in literature, in peace, and also in economics. But you see, I put a parenthesis around the economics, and I'll come back to that in, 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 a, in, in a short while. So Alfred Nobel, he was the do donor. That's what we call Nobel. And Alfred Nobel was a very special person. He died in 1896, and he wrote a will in 1895. And he donated all his fortune to the Nobel Prizes. His family didn't get a single cent, and they were very angry with their old uncle, who gave away all the money, and they didn't get anything. But I think he gave it away for a good cause. And Alfred Nobel was a very special person. He was a researcher, he was both a physicist, and he was a chemist. And of course, he was a already in, in the 19th century. And his discovery was nitroglycerin, and dynamite. And that was big at that time. It was like Google or Microsoft, you know, because when you could start to use dynamite and blast uh, rocks and stuff, you could start to build roads, you could start to build yeah, railways and so on, build houses where you couldn't build houses before. So this is very important. And he had a patent. He had made a discovery. So he earned loads of money loads of money. So uh, he, but at the same time, he gave away all this money in the end, because he had also started to have a little bit of a bad conscience. Have I done good or have I done bad in life? And the good, of course, was he, he could build roads and so on. But of course, dynamite was used in military to make bombs and, and weapons and stuff, you know. So he was really ambivalent to that. Have I done good or have I done bad? And people say that was one of the reasons why he gave away all his money uh, uh, for the prices. He was very, also very international. This was an era of nationalism in, in Europe. Uh, but he was international. He lived in Stockholm, of course. He lived in Finland. He lived in Russia. He lived in Paris. 
he lived in, uh, in Italy, he visited the United States, he, visited, he traveled around in Mexico in those days. So he was really an international person. And of course, I already mentioned that he was a donor also. So, here is his will. And of course, he lived in the time where there were no computers, no word processing, he could not type down his will. So he simply wrote it down on a piece of paper, handwritten, and that was discovered by his lawyers uh, when he had died. And what it says is that the whole of my remaining shall, I, I, I must read it here, so I said, uh, I, I, no, I cannot read it. You can read it yourself. It, it basically, it says uh, the whole of my uh, money should be invested and the return of this money should be done for the price. For people that has done the best of mankind. And you see, he was quite idealistic. It was in his will he done the best of mankind. So I think that was, was good. Yeah, Mexico, of course, you're good. You have won three Nobel Prizes. I hope you were aware of that, right? And I must tell you today, I learned something by a modest professor here at UNAM, that all three of these Nobel Prize winners, Mexican Nobel Prize winners, have passed through UNAM. What about that? Did you know that? So there is, of course, Alfonso Garcia won the Peace Prize in 1982. He shared it with a Swedish lady, actually, Alba Myrdal. Then we have Octavio Paz, Literature Prize in 1990. Uh, and there was a rumor at that time how many wives he had, but I don't remember the details of that. Yeah. And then the, I was involved personally in giving Mario Molina the Chemistry Prize in 1995. I'm very proud of that. And Mario Molina's prize, of course that's the only so far uh, science prize that's gone to a Mexican. And that's not any Nobel Prize because it was the first, I have to do it like this, it was the first prize in environmental chemistry. You may many times think about the prizes, Nobel Prizes in chemistry, someone that has done a synthesis of a new molecule in the lab, or, or determine a structure of a chemical molecule, or, or find out a new medicine or something like that. But Mario Molino and his care found out the reason for the ozone hole. And you remember the ozone hole was that we started to get a leakage. The ozone hole is like the sunglasses of our planet, right, that keeps us alive here, otherwise we should have so much UV radiation so we couldn't live here. And, and it started to deteriorate. Uh, and he, Mario Molina and his colleagues found out the reasons for that. And that was the freons that we used to have in our refrigerators, or the freons we had in spray, you know, when you were spraying your hair. I don't do that so much, but... Uh, uh, so, so, uh, and they went up in the atmosphere. And there they started a chain reaction with the ozone with the help of the solar light. So it's photochemical reactions between the freons and the oxygen that broke down the, 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 the ozone layer and started to take away our sunglasses. And this, because of Mario Molina's research, we knew how to do. We simply had to change the technology in our refrigerator and we didn't have to spray our hair anymore. That fixed it. And uh, it's not quite over the threat, but it's really being improved in the last 10 years because of his research. So we should be proud of that. So I'm coming back to Alfred Nobel now. As I said, he died in 1986, 1896, and there was this will in 1895. But he wrote, first he wrote, first will in 1892. And that will only contain the peace price. And remember I told you that he was a little bit uh, uncertain about if he was a good guy or a bad guy. So his first approach was to, to be bet a better guy, to donate all his fortune to a peace price, to, get, uh, to, to have less armies, have less horrible, horrible weapons and so on. 
So that was probably one reason. The other reason was that he at that time was friendly to a lady called Bertha von Sutter. I don't know how friendly he was to this lady, but they lived together in Paris anyway. And she, Bertha von Sutter, at the end of the 1900s, were the peace activist, the leading peace activist in, in Europe at that time. Um, and we have to remember that was times before the second, First World War and so on. So it was unsettled times in Europe. And she was a peace activist. However, however, sometimes relations don't work and they split up. And after they had split up, he wrote the second version of his will. And there he also inc included physics, chemistry, medicine, and literature. So uh, he was obviously influenced by women. And uh, even, so many times I get the, now this is chucking in here. I need some help. This is too high tech for me. No. <laughs> ah, here we go. Here we go. So I don't know if the battery is about to give. So <clears throat> I get many prizes when people heard I've been in the Nobel Committee. They ask me many questions. So why isn't there any Nobel Prize in mathematics? I mean, the smartest people on earth become mathematicians, right? How many of you are mathematicians? Good, that's right. It's smartest people, right? Correct. But there is no Nobel Prize in mathematics, in physics and chemistry. So uh, why was that? And I must come back to Alfred Nobel was never married and he had this uh, little bit problem maybe with women. Because when he was 21, he had a girlfriend. Uh, and they were sort of going steady for some time. But in the end, it didn't work. And she married a mathematician. <laughs> Can you imagine? And I think, you know, uh, that Alfred Nobel in his older days should give out his money and said, I'm not going to give any money to mathematicians, that's for sure, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that's why there is no. Uh, it's almost a true story. <laughs> yeah. And then I many times get the question, can there be more Nobel Prizes? Why don't we have now a Nobel Prize in sustainability, artificial intelligence, or global health, or something like that? It's not so easy, because what the Nobel committees do in Stockholm is actually fulfilling the will, fulfilling the wish of a dead person. And you don't go and toss around that upside down. But despite what I'm saying, there has been a prize added, that was the Nobel Prize added, that was not in the will. And that is the economics prize, economics prize in, in, in the Nobel Prize. And that's why I had it in parentheses. And actually, if one should be real, so, so that was added, uh, that, that was, uh, So <clears throat> that prize is actually not called a Nobel Prize if one's going to be strict. It's a prize in memory of Alfred Nobel, and the money comes from the Swedish government, not from the will of Alfred Nobel. And this has, the economics prize has not been given since 1901, since oh, as late as 1969. So. Uh, that's the story about the economics part. But of course, when media makes the, 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 the writing about the Nobel Prize for each year, they don't make the difference. So in practice, it is a Nobel Prize. I, mean, I think that, that's another statement. So why, I started off my talk by saying, why did the Nobel Prize become the price of the prices? The Nobel Prize is not the price with the highest amount of money. There are many prices from Saudi Arabia that are much higher money, but it's still by far the most prestigious price. So why is that? Not many times we'll say money talks, but here actually prestige is talking. And my theory, because it's a theory, is that it was the first international prize in 1895. And I repeat what I said before, that at that time when Alfred Nobel 
was a very unsettled time. There was a lot of nationalism. The countries were put together. Strong leaders preached about nationalism and so on. Have you heard? Is that happening now also? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it was very controversial for him to, to give, give away the, the, the money, actually. And the Swedish king was very upset by this rich man of Bell, who gave away Swedish money to foreigners. Not good at all. But, and the Swedish king even refers to come to the first Nobel ceremony because he was so angry. In this nationalistic spirit that was uh, um, very abundant at that time. It's also very high level institutions that award the prizes. And I'll come back to that. And <clears throat> there's also spent a lot of money of evaluating the prize. So there is this big endowment from Nobel where half of the money goes to the prize winners. But the other half goes to evaluating who is the worthy winner. So that means that the Nobel Committee in Stockholm has a lot of money to dig deep and really scrutinize the, candid the, the candidates. And I've been sitting in the Nobel Committee for uh, 11, 12 years. And I've also been in other prize com uh, committees. And, uh, the Nobel work is so much more thorough. You take the first opinion, second opinion, third opinion, and so on, while in other prizes maybe it's more a dinner conversation and then we say, let's give the prize to Charlie or something like that. You know? <laughs> Not the Nobel, it's uh, very thorough. So here I come back to this will, this magic will. And now I'm going to try to read anyway, so it says... It's in the end of that. It is my express wish that in awarding the prize, no consideration be given to the nationality of the candidates, but that the most worthy shall receive the prize and stand by, whether he is Scandinavian or not. And at that time, 120 years ago, but was controversial, as I said, was the Scandinavian or not. Today, in 2019, I think the most controversial was that he said, he, at least 50% of you out here in the audience should be very angry, right? I mean, women are at least as smart as men, right? So, uh, but I will come back to that, that this he was not interpreted very seriously in the years to come. Not perfect either. So, the awarding institutions, I said, are very important. So, so, the Physics and Chemistry Prize and the Economic Prize are given by the Royal Academy of Sciences in Stockholm, which, to which I belong. That's why I've been involved in this work. The Medical Prize is given by the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, which is one of the top medical schools in the world. The Swedish Academy, which is a human humanities academy, gives out the Literature Prize. And... The Norwegian Parliament in Oslo gives out the Peace Prize. So why Norwegian Parliament and why Oslo? After all, Alfred Nobel was Swedish and the other prizes are giving out in Stockholm. Well, at that time, in 1895, Sweden and Norway was one country. And it was only in 1905 the Norwegians came and said, we don't want to play with you Swedes anymore. And they created their own country. And then the Norwegians found all this oil, so we Swedes are very upset by this. But, um, uh, but Norbel was very much for the two countries staying together. That's why he said one of these prizes should be given out in the western part of the country in Oslo. Uh, so that's the reason. Many people also said, <laughs> Alfred Nobel was such a national, international person. And um, uh, he said everyone can get the prize wherever they come in the world. But actually when he said about the evaluation of the prizes should be done of Scandinavians. And he, he had an explanation for that. He said that Scandinavians tend to be less corrupt than others. 
He didn't say they were not corrupt, they were less corrupt. So this was his view. And, maybe, and actually, when you look at the United Nations anti-corruption leagues, the five Nordic countries and Singapore actually are always leading the pack. <laughs> so Nobel was uh, at least right in that sense. Then there is something called the Nobel Foundation, and they actually don't select the prizes. That's just the academics within these various academies. The Nobel Foundation uh, invests the money, so the endowment grows, and you can give out the prizes every year. So it's very important. Yeah, so why do you get a Nobel Prize? Yeah, Nobel said, use the term discovery when it was about the, 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 the science prizes. And he even had a vote note, and he said, it should be a discovery and not a lifetime work. And I think it was very smart, because you could imagine that the prizes was given to the most pompous professor in Harvard or the most pompous professor in Cambridge as sort of a routine when they retired, for example. So by saying this, it should be a discovery. It should be the one that opened the door to a new knowledge or a new field who should win the prize. And I think that has been the case. And many times when the Nobel Prize is criticized, because some French professor said, I am more important than this guy who got the prize. It's because he may be the big wheeler in the field, but he may not have done a discovery. So I, th I like that very much. I think it's a very special aspect of the Nobel Prize. And maybe that also is a reason why it still have remained so iconic. It also said in, in physics, it's a discovery or invention. And of course, you could say that was a reflection on Nobel himself. He had done a, a discovery and an invention. In chemistry, it's also discovery. But there, for some reason, which people don't know, he also added best improvement. So I don't know if he was looking down at chemistry or not. You know? I'm a chemist, right? <laughs> then in medicine was also uh, discovery. Then, of course, when it came to literature, it, it was another ball game. So then he said, most outstanding work in an ideal direction. And here you see this inventor was a very, he also liked humanities. So, <laughs> and uh, in, in peace, done the most for the best work for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of armies, and the promotion of peace congresses. Of course, the other two may be harder to judge. Science is fairly easy to judge. The criteria are clear. In, in the others, the criteria may not, not be 100% clear. And many times when there are discussions about the Nobel Prizes, it's in literature and peace. Physics, chemistry, and medicine normally passes without too much noise. Uh, I think that's my... So how to select prize winners? Maximally, there are three persons can share a prize. So you cannot win a whole group. A research group of 12 pay persons cannot win a Nobel Prize. So maximally three, one, two, or three in various combinations. And uh, you, you get about, I don't know, you see, it's about uh, uh, 20 million pesos. That's what the Nobel Prize is. And, uh, at least I think that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, that's, yeah. can, I, can I test it here, maybe? Aha, I'm very smart. <laughs> yeah. So for each prize, there is a Nobel committee. So there's a Nobel committee in chemistry, there's a Nobel committee in physics, a Nobel committee in medicine, and so forth. And they give a, give a, a suggestion to the academies, and then they vote. 
And each year there should be nominations. And the nominations should be by the 31st of January. Last week, all the nominations have come to, to Stockholm. And this may shock you. You cannot send an email. You have to send a snail mail with the nomination, with a stamp and everything, you know. And who can nominate? Previous Nobel Prize winners can nominate the prize. So a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics can nominate for next year's prize in physics as well. Professors in Scandinavia can nominate. Expert at centers of uh, excellence around the world. So the dean of chemistry in Stanford, or MIT, or Imperial College always can nominate, for example. And then in Stockholm, we also select uh, a couple of hundred individual ex experts that we trust to, to make the, the, the judgment. And every year we get 400 nominations. So typically 400 nominations in physics, 400 in chemistry, and so forth. And that we get on the 31st of January. Then we have to make a short list because we have to find one of these 400. And we're not supposed to make a mistake. Right? So it's quite a tough job. And I say, and when people hear that I, I, I was been in the Nobel Committee, they say, oh, this is very glamorous. And I say, okay, but it's a lot of bloody work, I can tell you. That's, uh, that's what it is, you know. So how to select the prize winners. So we have the committees, and uh, we have international experts that we fly in to, to, the, to Stockholm to consult them. Everything is very secret, you know, this cannot leak out so, to avoid lobbying and stuff like that. And um, there's also a high degree of secrecy. And I would argue, from my 10 years experience, it's excellence only. Uh, many say, oh, there must be a lot of lobbying for this. Yes, I have seen lobbying, but that is so easy to unravel. And if, you, if we disclose that someone is being lobbied, we take them and put it in the wastebasket. The other one is a lot of politics. It's not, uh, at least not for uh, the science prices. Uh, and the 10 years I was there, I didn't hear one single, single <laughs> A political argument. In literature, and of course, peace may be another ball game, right? So th this uh, is something one has to keep in mind, of course. So the committees should be ready by their nomination in August, September, and the first week in October, we announce the prices. And you can imagine how many people are sitting at their telephones waiting waiting. Sometimes the telephone rings. Most of the time it does not ring. So there are a lot of uh, disappointed people that oh, this year I will get the prize. But of course for those that wins it is great. But you have to remember we have done the voting in Stockholm in the afternoon of the 10th of October. Then it's almost night in Asia, early, early morning in the United States and Mexico. <laughs> so many times this is uh, quite tricky to get the people to tell them. And you see before, normally when we, we have decided Nobel Prize, we go out and we meet the press and there's the CNN, BBC and all the big news media there to, to hear from the committee who is going to win this prize in a certain area. Uh, but before we do that, we have to go and phone the, the prize winner. Many times wake them up in the middle of the night. Uh, and of course, this is very emotional. You know, people are very touched uh, and, and so on. So they are not, they're okay by waking, waking, waking up four o'clock in the morning. They are quite okay with it. But, one year I was the chairman and I was supposed to write, uh, phone a Nobel Prize winner. I think it was in 1993. This was for site-directed mutagenesis. You're the biologist, know what that is, how you can change the, the DNA in order to create new types of protein. And his name was Michael Smith, and he lived in Vancouver, UBC in Vancouver. 
So I, my task was to phone him. So I had done my duty, I thought, so I was phoning him from Stockholm there, and uh, suddenly there was someone uh, answering the phone, Michael Smith. Uh, and I said, uh, this is Professor Bertil Andersson from the Nobel Committee in Stockholm, and I have the honor to convey to you the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year. And I thought, he, I was expected, what? Great! No, not that. So, so, so I hear just silent, and then I heard on the other side of the line, oof. <laughs> and and, and I, I thought, you know, I, wasn't I clear enough? So, so I, I repeated this. Again, silence, and then he was more talkative, and he said, oof, oof. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, well, what is this? You know, so I said, isn't this Professor Michael Smith? And then from the other side with a sleepy voice, not Professor. We had phoned the wrong person and offered the Nobel Prize. Very embarrassing. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. So, you see, it's not only glamour. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, this is how it goes. The right Michael Smith heard it when he was driving uh, into Vancouver, into his lab in the morning in the radio when he was driving. He almost turned off the highways. <laughs> yeah. so, and then on the 10th of December, two months later, then you, you announce, then it's the giving out of the prizes from the hands of the king, very glamorous, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that later on. There is a, a role, of course, that, and that was also in Alfred Nobel's memory, you cannot give the prize to a dead person. You, might, you can go, not give it posthumous. posthumous. Um, but there has been two people that was very unpolite to the Nobel Committee because they died between the 10th of October and the 10th of December. Not very nice. Yeah. Actually, we allow them to have the prize, so their relatives to have the prize, because we actually gave it in October. The, the ceremony in, the, in December is only the formality, the glamour about it. And as I said, the prize in peace is given in Oslo, not in Stockholm. So Barack Obama, for example, he never came to Stockholm. He came to Oslo to pick up his prize. The Nobel Prize, of course, we do a lot of research, committee protocols and, and all these analysis, quite deep analysis. But they are secret for 50 years. And some people say, oh, isn't this untransparent and so on. And I say no, because if you know what you said is secret for 50 years, you actually say the truth. You're not worried that some newspaper would blow it up or some... A French professor or, or, or Spanish politician will start to complain about it, right? Uh, so, so that's the rule. So I think it's a good rule. I did my first one in 1988, so I still have uh, 20 years of peace uh, uh, that they cannot cut me down. Let me talk some about some, some prize winners. Of course, the Nobel Prize is one thing, but it's also about the the, 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 the Nobel, Nobel laureates. So uh, there are 590 Nobel Prizes, and there are about almost today 900 Nobel Prize winners since 1901. 900 people have got this super honor. And of course you realize it's really the tip of the iceberg of the academic system. 900 people since 1901. That's quite okay. So if Molina was here at UNAM, you should be quite, it's a quite okay, I think. It's quite okay. Uh, but now, there's actually only about 57 today, women who has got it. 6% of the Nobel Prize winners are women, and that is quite embarrassing for the committees in Stockholm, because, uh, uh, and this is an issue. More recently, there have been more and more women getting the prize in medicine, actually. So, so that is an improvement. Also in literature, there's been 
and peace. But physics is the most hopeless case when it comes to selecting women. Uh, and chemistry is not very bad either. Um, the youngest Nobel laureate was quite recently Matara Yousafi from Pakistan who was protesting with risk for her own life from the uh, very uh, militant Muslims. And she stood up and was not scared. In the end, she got the Nobel Prize for her uh, courage to do, to do that and for her way to spread the gospel. Uh, the oldest one is in economics, uh, Leonard Hurwitz. If you get the Nobel Prize, if someone phones you in the middle of the night and say, you have won the Nobel Prize. You cannot say, no, I don't want it. You cannot say that because in the records, uh, uh, in the history of mankind about science, you are, the, you are the Nobel Prize winner that year in that discipline. The only thing you can do is not to come to Stockholm or Oslo and pick up the prize. And there are only two people since 1901 who has not come and picked up the prize. And that is Jean-Paul Sartre. And those uh, literature knows he was a very radical, socially engaged novelist in the 50s and 60s. And he said, oh, they phoned me about Nobel Prize, bourgeoisie, he said. I don't want that prize. And he actually didn't come to Stockholm and pick up the prize. So he kept to his norms, right? At least he kept to his norm 10 years after, because after 10 years he divorced his wife, and that became a very expensive divorce, and now he wanted to have the price. <laughs> so that's called pragmatism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, the other one is Lee Dok Tu, who was the foreign minister of Vietnam, who got the prize together with Henry Kissinger after the Vietnam War. Uh, and he refused to come and stand with the sides of the imperialist Henry Kissinger, uh, so he never came uh, and, and took up the prize side. So these are the only two. There is one more, almost half, because you may remember two years ago, Bob Dylan got the Nobel Prize. And in the end he came, but he came a couple of days after, so he didn't come when there was all this sort of glory and so on, and we allowed that. And there was also debate was a debate, will, will, uh, Alf, will, will Bob Dylan come to Stockholm and pick up the prize, or will he not come? And in the end, uh, we, we just followed his poetry and said, well, is Bob Dylan coming or not? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, then, sadly, of course, there has been political regimes that have forbid Nobel Prize winners to come to Stockholm and pick it up. And there are two, I think there are two countries we can name and shame, and that is uh, the, the fascist Germany, and also Soviet Union well, did that to, his, uh, to its um, um, uh, inhabitants when they got the Nobel Prize. So that's a, a stain, not on the Nobel Prize, but on these regimes, of course. Multiple, no, I, I said before, think, and 900 people in these 120 years have got the prize. But this, so, I mean, this is almost enormous. But there are a few people that actually have got two Nobel Prizes, and that is quite exceptional. And I think the most exceptional, for several reasons, is Marie Curie, who won the prize already in 1903. So here the Nobel Committee did a grand start. Remember, that was this in the will, that he should be Scandinavian or not. But already in 1903, they gave it to a woman, to Marie Curie. Marie Curie, of course, is, uh, sounds French and is French, but of course she was from Poland. Her, her real name was Marie Skolowskaya. Uh, and she then got the Nobel Prize again in 1911. And of course, her discoveries was around the radioactivity, uh, which of course, we must admit, was very seminal at that time in history, in science history. There's also Fred Sanger, who got the prize 
He was from Cambridge, so he got the prize in chemistry both 58 and 1980, so 22 years behind. And in 58, he developed techniques to sequence proteins, to know how the proteins that runs our bodies were built up. And um, then in 1980, he got the prize for sequencing of DNA, which of course is the basis for gene technology today, all forensic analysis and all databases uh, and, and, and so on. So this was very important. Uh, Joe Burden, particle physicist, twice. Linus Pauling up there is probably also quite unique. He won two Nobel Prizes. One in chemistry, structure of proteins, living materia. And then he won the Peace Prize. And it's quite unique that the same person has won the Chemistry Prize and the Peace Prize. And he won the Peace Prize because after he had been a Nobel Prize winner and he was quite famous, he engaged in all uh, tests against nuclear weapons. And he was at the barricade with his students protesting against this. And uh, he also wrote many articles uh, about this. And he got the Nobel Prize also in peace. The Red Cross has got the prize three times. And I said it has to be a person, but in the Peace Prize also can be given to organizations like Red Cross, UNICEF, and, and so on. There's also been uh, family Nobel Prizes. We have married couples, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, Irene Choliot Curie, Frederick Choliot, Corey and Corey. There was a discovery around diabetes. Alva Midal, Gunnar Midal is in a Peace Prize. But I think the most interesting there is mother and daughter. So I told you that Marie Curie was the first woman who got the Nobel Prize. An interesting historic fact is the second woman who got the Nobel Prize was Marie Curie's daughter. And I think that's quite interesting aspect. Uh, and of course, he was married to a guy who also got it. So they, they were really a family team, those team in these early, early days. Uh, many a father and son, Bragg and Bragg in physics, Bohr, the Bohr family quite famous, Copenhagen, uh, and uh, uh, Hans von Euler and Ulf von Euler, Swedish couple, Karolinska Institute, Siegbans, also Sweden, um, Kornberg and Kornberg, fairly recent in molecular biology, and they were brothers in etology. I told you about this that sometimes the Nobel Prize maybe be criticized because it's old guys who got it, you know, but that's not entirely true. And in, in uh, one year, we gave the prize in. Uh, uh, to, to mass spectrometry and how to use mass spectrometry to analyze big molecules, proteins, nucleic acids. Before it was only possible to use small molecules for mass spec. And after many experts had been consulted, we had read every paper in the area, we realized that was a guy called Kochi Tanaka that worked on the Shimatsu company in Tokyo who actually had done this discovery. He opened the door. So it was only one issue. He was not a professor. He was not a doctor. He was a, one of the engineers in the team, in the factory. But he had done it. So, and this was a little bit controversial. We gave the prize to this engineer at this engineering company in Japan. And people said, who, who is that, you know? We knew who it was, because he actually done the discovery. But you you're, no, know, Japan can in some ways be very hierarchical. So when this was announced, the CEO of the Shimatsu company phoned us in Stockholm and said, I'm coming to pick up the price for my employee, Tanaka. And we said, no, you're not. You're not. Tanaka is coming to Stockholm, and so he did. And it was quite hard for the Japanese system in the hierarchy to see how do you deal with an engineer to he suddenly raises up through the, the, the hierarchy of the system. So that was 
also a, a social thing. But that also shows you that the, the Nobel Prize committees can be very established. But we are also radical when we need to be radical. And I'm proud of that. The most popular Nobel Prize is the double helix, the DNA double helix of Watson and Crick. That is an iconic prize. Always when the, you mention this, it's a double helix. And of course, it was very important to understand how our, our, our inheritance was at the molecular level, the DNA, the four bases, and all this. And of course, the DNA is also very beautiful, right? It's an architectural masterpiece from evolution uh, uh, as well. So this is the most popular prize. I, I have a prize. I have a favorite prize. That I, when I was involved in giving prizes, and that is to the Fullerins that was given to one English and two Americans. And what is Fullerins? It's like buckyballs of carbon. And that was the th third form of carbon. So big deal, you say, what's special with that? Well, I think all of you had studied some chemistry in high school and so on. And you know, according to the dogmas, there were two forms of carbon. Graphite, like when you write with a pencil, right? And diamond. These were the two forms of carbon. And that was in the first page of the chemistry books. This was fundamentals of fundamentals. And carbon, of course, is a very important element. We, human beings, are carbons on, on two legs, right? That's what we are. A little bit water also. <laughs> so so th this was really groundbreaking, that there actually was a third form of carbon one of our most important elements, totally unexpected. And I think if some people have said, you know, look here, I have this bright idea that there is another form of carbon, people have said, you're an idiot. Uh, do something smarter than going around and do blah, blah. But it was. It was proven. So now we have three. The, you see, sometimes one feels you have to re Nobel Prize new information, you have to fix a little bit. But this time you had to rewrite the first page in the chemistry textbooks for students. It was so basic. And I think there's another take home lesson of this, that we tend in these advanced days to think we know everything. There's not much to know. And I have news for you guys. There is. We don't know everything. We don't even know the fundamentals. And this, I think, is one of the biggest arguments for blue sky research. We should have applied research. But this is a strong argument for blue sky research, that you, as late as in the end of the 1990s, we could discover something fundamental like this. And I'm sure there is more stories like that to be discovered. Good luck. Do it. I'm told you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, the Nobel Prizes are given individually, but it's always interesting to see at what universities were Nobel Prize winners working when they got the prize. And maybe not the super surprise, uh, Harvard is number one, uh, Stanford is number two, MIT number three, the normal sub sub suspects, right? Uh, Cal Caltech, Berkeley, Columbia, only on the seventh place or eighth is Cambridge University. And then, uh, so Cambridge, if one put the two Cambridge units, if you put them together, they would be quite high at Oxford, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and, 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 and so on. So, of course, this is very boring because it's the United States and the UK is dominating the scene almost totally. But, if you, I haven't the slide showing that, uh, but if you look at Nobel Prizes after 1980s, say the last 30, 40 years, and not the whole post war it's not Harvard anymore who number one. Who would you think is today number one in winning Nobel Prizes uh, uh, of the universities in the world? Said, anyone said MIT? Yeah. Who was said that? 
Good. Yeah, yeah, but you're cheating. <laughs> yeah. So MIT is today leading the pack. And of course, you see, there's a, this uh, between UNAM and Tech de Monterey, well, the, the, the same between Boston, uh, Harvard, and MIT in Boston, right? Or Cambridge. So there has been a, an internal fight, and the runner up have taken power now. So that's quite interesting. So now I have talked about the past, about the history. Let me do some speculations uh, or some predictions. And you know, it's always hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. So uh, I believe strongly that an area that's going to get many Nobel Prizes is the brain, how the elucidation of the brain. Because today we know most of our kidneys, about our livers, about our knees and uh, heart and so on. But we don't know much about our brain. The thing that we have above our shoulders is still something that we really, really don't know. We don't know what is thoughts, what is the um, uh, dreams and so on. And I, sometimes I say something that makes humanities people very uh, angry. We don't know the molecular biology of our soul. <laughs> and that's quite interesting. Uh, aspect. So this I believe that there are going to be many prizes in, in the future. Another prize, I think, and we have talked about it today when I had dinner with the faculty here. Here you go. It's in energy. I mean, <clears throat> this planet has an energy crisis, has a climate change. And I went today to the botanical garden here at UNAM. I was ever so impressed, particularly about all the cactuses and so on. And plants are smarter than humans because plants solved their energy crisis long time ago. Plants can provide all energy in the world by sunlight, carbon dioxide, water. And by that they can synthesize anything, any molecule better than any humans can do. So of course, and the only waste product is the oxygen that we breathe. Not too bad, right? And that of course paved the way for animal life later on, right? I work in this field, so... <laughs> yeah. So, you see, if we could create an artificial leaf we basically have solved our energy crisis. And uh, I think Galileo always, when he looked at the birds, he said, if birds can fly, we can fly. And I say, if plants can do ultimate energy, we can do ultimate energy. So you fix it, guys. You young guys have to fix it. Uh, yeah, I'm too old. <laughs> And then you can win the prize, right? That's a good. Remember, 20 million pesos. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, 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 I'm going to retire this one and just go this. So, what happens on the 10th of December? That's when the Nobel Prize is giving out. It's minus 20 degrees in Stockholm and it's dark the whole day. Yet people come to pick up their prices, despite it's so harsh quite. And everyone dresses up. I dress up in white ta ta tail and things like that. You know, I look like a penguin. Uh, uh, and everyone was there, you know, ladies in nice dresses and so on. And the prize winners get the prize from the hands of the king, King Carl Gustav. So it's a big ceremony in, 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 in Stockholm. And after that, after that, comes the biggest party in Europe. 1,500 guests, all dressed up. Golden, uh, China, kings, presidents, uh, ambassadors, professors, prize winners. Uh, 300 students are invited to, to this uh, event, which is a super event. And uh, since I came here, I have promised some tech students to 
come with me for this party, should we include uh, your name as well? Or no? <laughs> okay. So um, this is a fantastic uh, 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 event, and everyone likes it. It's a, you know, it's glamour. And science professors normally are not very glamorous, right? No, no, yeah. But I'm happy that one day a year, science is in the focus, and that's okay with a little bit glamour, I think. Have anyone seen this film? Yeah, good. This is about the Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm. And the film, now I'm going to destroy the film for you. I'm going to tell you the, the, the final scene of this film. Okay? <laughs> so, so this is about a professor, a literature professor in the United States, who wins the literature prize because his seminal, socially engaged books, you know, and the committee in Stockholm decide to give the prize to him. And, of course, he and his wife, and, you know, this is the story. The wife was his lady student some 20 years ago, but they're still together and, and all this. So they travel to Stockholm. They come to Stockholm in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the coldness, and all this glamour, and he receives his prize. But there on stage, he basically breaks down and gives a speech, and he admits that he had not written these books, but it was his wife, the lady student, that had written all the books. I, I think still you should go and see the film, right? <laughs> so so uh, I think it's an interesting film because it is lit by the Nobel Prize and the environment, and I've only been able to show you. So when, when you have an opportunity, go and, 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 and see it. And of course, I think we need more than three Mexican Nobel Prizes. We must have, I think now I should be very polite. And I said, let's have another one for UNAM and one for Tech de Monterrey, right? <laughs> With that, I say thank you very much. Gracias. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, I think we have some questions. Our chairperson. Okay. Two. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite amazing. Um, I was just wondering if you have an expectation about the budget of the recent Nobel Prize in Chemistry, how much was uh, funding needed to make a discovery in the field? You, you mean how the professor? I think if you're in, in, uh, in uh, chemical theory, it may be quite cheap. But of course, in, in many of the life science, by chemical one, molecular biology, of course, you may need uh, to go to a synchrotron. Uh, it costs billions and billions uh, uh, and so on. So, to be fair, you see, in experimental science, in physics, chemistry, and medicine, yes, I guess those that have won the Nobel Prize winners have needed a fair amount of, of uh, funding. Uh, I believe, however, it may not have been uh, the, that they could measure something at a very high resolution. Probably the idea that they had was more important. Oh, well, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. I, I think it was really illustrative. Uh, my question is, um, you said that one field that may have a lot of Nobel Prizes in the next years uh, is artificial photosynthesis. Uh, but my question is, uh, why create an artificial leaf, artificial photosynthesis, if there are already natural leaves, and why not instead uh, that the research is focused on uh, finding out how to use these leaves to other ends else than metabolism? Uh, no, I, I, I agree with you, it, and it's not either or, it's both, in my book. Oh, okay. So, so natural photosynthesis 
have already through history had six Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so, so I think it's been quite well recognized uh, since uh, I think it was 1920 when the first uh, when chlorophyll was discovered. Uh, so, so that is probably quite okay. What, 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 you see, the, the, the natural photosynthesis, the beautiful leaves that we have, you know, are sort of very useful, but not very efficient. It's basically, on the average, only 2% of the solar irradiation that is being used. If you could do an artificial system where you actually use the reaction centers within the, the leaves, you take out the engine from the car, you could say, and only run the engine. You can get up to 90% efficiency. So that's where the trick is. Mm, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. I have to, to tell you. Hi. <laughs> I agree with you about Harold Roto and the award. And I want to know your view about the Latin American best in science, because these uh, really big prizes and these awards implies a lot of investing research in each country. Yeah. So what do you tell to nations like Mexico or Latin America, which budgets in science are very low? Thank you very much. No, I believe uh, correctly what you say, that the proportion of Nobel Prize winners is probably proportional to the investments in the country, at least in crude terms. So why? The same, the, the, before the First World War, which country won most Nobel Prize? It was Germany, actually. After the Second World War, it was US and UK. Of course, these were the dominant countries, uh, and so on. So that follows. But of course, Mexico had already Nobel Prize winners, so it's not uh, completely pitch dark, right? And uh, there's also been Nobel Prize winners from other Latin American countries. But of course, I believe, maybe not only because of Nobel Prize winners, that the Latin American countries have to invest more uh, in, the fu in their future. And that is part of education and R&D. And take example of Asia. 25 years ago, Korea was not a rich country. China was not a rich country. Singapore and Hong Kong was not rich countries. Today, these are rich countries in, in 25 years only. And they invested in research and development are really blooming now. So that should be encouraging to Latin America, that you're not doomed to be uh, down in, uh, in the lower levels. You can change. You can change. What was this president uh, before Trump? What did he say? He said, yes, you can. <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> here. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, in regards to the budget, uh, like a contingency. Um, what would you say to some people that are... Uh, that I think they should invest more in some specific science areas because they think that they, 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 these areas are important to solving the future problems. I, I want to know your opinion because I, I am wondering if, if some sort of luck sometimes can uh, be involved in winning the prize and you never know where the next big discovery will be. Uh, yeah, correct. But you see, this luck, you know, Pasteur, also a very big scientist who did this guy before, he said, chance favors the prepared mind. So this is one thing you can take home. The other one is, in, I don't think one can be too tactical, because the science development is unpredictable. Today it may say you should put it into artificial intelligence and so on, but in X years that may not be so. So I say, you know, follow your heart. <laughs> Hi, hi, Professor. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. I'm here. <laughs> here. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions uh, really fast. The first one is quite general, uh, which is uh, which fields do you consider in biological science that will be potentially awarded with other Nobel Prizes in future beside neuroscience and artificial photosynthesis? 
And the second one, it's related to why the CRISPR-Cas technology haven't achieved a Nobel Prize yet, considering the huge impact that it has yeah. so, uh, let in me, biology. Uh, I, I, I can ask, I'm going to ask you, answer your first questions at the same time. Okay. So if uh, there's something else between brain and, uh, uh, yeah. uh, and the artificial, it's exactly what you talk about, the CRISPR. Particularly since a Swedish lady that I contributed to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Secondly, many times I get this question, why hasn't this and this got the prize? And I always say, sometimes patience can pay off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't say anything more than that, right? And no. <laughs> <laughs> But I understood the message. <laughs> oh, here, sir. Um, I'll thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoy it. You see, um, one of the things that really baffled me about a uh, Nobel Prize winners is that, well, a long time ago I read in an atlas about that uh, this little country, I'm telling, I'm telling country, uh, St. Lucia, and is it not really proportionally speaking has the largest um, win Nobel Prize winners within its population, and it's not a very rich country. Which one is that? Um, <coughs> Santa Lucia. Its, it's capital is uh, okay. Castries. Yeah, but they, they are just there's a low population, and I think two of them are in literature, right? I believe so, yeah. Uh, there are three and... Um, but you see, when we, when we, I can assure you, when we sit down there in the committees, we don't look at the country. We look at the person. It's not to say, oh, this year it's time to give it to a French person, or this time it's given to a Belgian. It's not on the radar screen. So, th th you see, when I now show this list of uh, universities that had most Nobel Prize winners, I mean, that is sort of a fun game after. That is nothing that is in the ball game when we decide. Yeah, I know, but it's interesting that it's not a rich country. It's an Antillean country in the Caribbean and has in proportion that many. But, I mean, to write a book, you don't have to be rich. You have to be creative. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I'm writing a movie screenplay myself, so... All right. Continue. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, here. Sure. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you about uh, physics. I, I kind of realized that you didn't talk about physics, like uh, the, the field that you think can be uh, like a good way to get an offer prize or something. So I would like, uh, I would like to, to know what your opinion is about physics, yeah. or theory of physics, uh, if it's of possible. Physics, of course, has been a lot have a big proportion got the particle physics to understand matter basically, right? And there's been some in more uh, applied physics. I'm very much keen on interdisciplinary research. And I think maybe a Nobel Prize in physics should go to atomic biology, where we really can now elucidate our biological structures, not only on the molecular level, but actually on the atomic level. And I feel the artificial photosynthesis I mentioned is almost like we have solved the structure uh, to create artificial leaf on a molecular level. But actually, that is not good enough. You have to go to uh, yet another level of, of um, detail. And that is atomic biology. And atomic biology, I think, is something that is coming very strong around the corners. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, what advice could you give us to college students that are preparing to dedicate our lives to science? Well, oh yeah, there you go. Okay. What, what, can you repeat it? Sorry. That which advice could you give us to college students that are prepared to dedicate our lives to science? What is your, what is your advice to yeah. them? I, I think, um, of course, you have to be interested and you have to follow your interest and what I said to your colleague over there, follow your heart or, 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 or your brain, you know. Uh, I also think it's a lot by self-confidence, believing in yourself. Because many stories that I hear Nobel Prize winners give when, uh, when I meet them in Stockholm say, 
oh, you know, I did these experiments and I went out and talked to them to my senior colleagues and they almost laughed at me and said, oh, Charlie, it cannot be like that. And they didn't give up by that. They actually continued and pursued their, their, their ideas despite being ridiculed, because being resisted. And in the end, truth always wins. You see. So they will come right. So, so I think uh, that may be a couple of advice I, I would send to you. And work hard. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for the talk and uh, for your visit here. Uh, my question is a bit oriented in the way that the other students asked you. Um, your talk was uh, named How to Win a Nobel Prize, and I wanted to ask you if that was only a marketing uh, measure <laughs> you took, or I know. I, I want to know, I know it takes a lot of work and effort and lots of years and patience, uh, but I wanted to know if you had like a specific advice for us, not only to win a Nobel Prize, but uh, to fulfill the goal that no. that, that uh, no, you, implies, I mean, to, no. to create an advancement in mankind, sorry. <laughs> it's absolutely right, I mean, Nobel Prize. I, sometimes I don't even feel you should have that as your goal because it's too, it's 900 in 120 years. If you get the Nobel Prize, you should be really happy. But more important, I think that's what you mean, that you strive to, to be successful in, in, in what you're doing, that you feel good with it, you know. And I must say, I have not won a Nobel Prize, I have given out Nobel Prizes. But I must say, you know, when I decided to study, and that was not clear to me because I came from a very poor background, and if I hadn't grown up in a socialistic country like Sweden, I could never have studied. And I, I was allowed to do that. And I got the fantastic teachers that inspired me, not to win the Nobel Prize, but to continue to work with research and teaching. And that has given me a lot. Then I have been in the Nobel Committee of Singapore and so on, but that were extra bonuses. The most important thing is that gave me a, a fantastic career. And sometimes I say, you know, it's a privilege to hear you work and you hope it as the same thing, you know. It can sound narrow-minded, but I feel it, 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 it's true. So I, I agree with you. Thank you. Here. Yeah, good. good evening. Hi. Uh, I'd love to hear your version or your opinion. Uh, why isn't there a mathematics Nobel Prize? That is not the uh, mathematics? Yes. I told you the true story. <laughs> but, but you said that's... Ah, uh, uh, you, you, won't, you won't have more details. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, no, the, the, it's true that the uh, Nobel... Um, um, had a girlfriend uh, that he, uh, there was a professor that I think he didn't like so to start with and he was a mathematician in the end uh, he married uh, his ex-girlfriend and I think that's as much detail as he can give. We have time for one more question. Uh, Anyone? Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for, for coming to to, to know. Um, I have a question. I am, I am a student of food engineering. I am, I am from to the Fresco Titlan in the north of the, of the Mexico City. <clears throat> My question is, do you think that a food engineer could be uh, win a PS Nobel Prize? Is, that, is, is, is possible? That, that, that an engineer can win a Nobel Prize. Yeah, that can. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, uh, I am a food engineer a student. And, and I think, I mean, engineering has already won many Nobel Prizes. I mean, uh, it was uh, 15 years ago that the inventors of Texas Instruments got the Nobel Prize. So, so although it's not explicitly said that there is a Nobel Prize in engineering, a lot of engineers have won the prize. And I, and I talked about this Tanaka today, who surprisingly won the Nobel Prize. He was an engineer, a young engineer. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, 
Ya, ya habían terminado. Ya habían terminado las preguntas. Sí, sí, sí. That was all for the questions. Thank you. Gracias a todos. Thank you, Professor. Muchas gracias, Profesor. Gracias por venir. Muchas gracias a la Coordinación de Innovación, porque gracias a ellos lo tenemos aquí. Este, gracias por permitirnos tenerlos a todos ustedes aquí y venir a organizarlo. I am thanking uh, y profesor oh, yeah. maestro Romero, por favor. Yeah, yes. Este, Anne, pase. Can I do one thing first? Yes. I want to give an applause to all students. Super question. Bravo. Para el estudiante de física quiero decirle que un porcentaje altísimo de los premios Nobel de Medicina los ganaron físicos. Digo, por si no lo sacamos en física podemos tratar por otro lado. Y algo que dijo que era muy importante en la comida que tuvimos hace rato. I, I had lunch with with a professor this today, and he said something that is very important, and now I am sure everybody understands what I'm saying. He says, instead of talking, you have to go and do it. So I think this is a big lesson. Instead of thinking and rethinking and rethinking how we're going to do something, we have to go ahead and do it. So thank you very much for your lessons. It's a promise and a threat. I can come and give another talk. Yes, <laughs> he's coming back in October. He already promised that. Yes, yes. Agua, no quiero ofrecerle agua. Sí. 